good evening, good afternoon, good morning. Uh, welcome to our 11th lecture through historical theology. Um, this is going to be a two-parter. Uh, we're going to be looking at Basil of Caesarea. Again, he is one of the Cappadocian fathers. He is actually the third of them, the final Cappadocian father of the trios. Uh, father of the trio, excuse me. Um, yeah, so again, a lot to say about him. Um, but he is definitely uh, not the least. I mean, he's the least, but he's definitely the greatest of the three. Uh, so definitely uh, glad to get, get going through him today. So first half we'll cover... Um, well, actually, we're going to cover up through book three of one of his main works on uh, called Against Eunomius. And so we're going to talk about the spirit that he wrote specifically on the spirit. One of the first to write on the spirit. He'll be on the second lecture. So we're going to go ahead and get started. And uh, yeah, get going for Basil. Oops, jumping too far ahead. All right. So Basil, they call him Basil the Great. And I should go ahead and skip to this next one. Okay. <clears throat> Basil the Great. Leading figure of the group of the three. So he was the greatest of the trio. Uh, basically, he was the one that really he was heavy handed against the Arians uh, in the later fourth century. Uh, he became the chief architect of the Doctrine of the Trinity, which became definitive for the East and the West. And again, when we say architect, we're not saying that he came up with the doctrine, but really it's the formulation of the Doctrine of the Trinity uh, as derived through Scripture. But uh, Basil denies that unbegottenness is an adequate definition of the essence of God and defends the doctrine, which he inherited from Origen and Athanasius, of the eternal generation of the Son. Now, if you're up to date on modern, modern heresies and and modern uh, discussions, uh, the eternal functional subordination of the Son, of the son is, a, is a big topic right now. Um, again, obviously this was came back from very, very long ago. So that's something that, as you can see, that transitioned into um, later theologians was these, these key understandings of the unbegottenness of the Son. Uh, but as we'll see as we go through this, the issue was of assigning the unbegottenness to indicate divine essence. <clears throat> So, but as we know, uh, the generation of creatures is physical and temporal, whereas the generation of the sun would be ineffable and eternal. Here, Basil makes the distinction between, uh, I'm sorry, here Basil makes his distinctive contribution to Trinitarian doctrine. So Athanasius and the older Nicenes had defended the deity of the sun by insisting that he was consubstantial or homoousios with um, of the father, which means of the same essence or substance. Uh, but Basil made a distinction between usia and hypostasis, which confusingly may also be literally translated as substance, uh, but he makes them ultimately uh, interchangeable. So he spoke of one usia of God, but three hypostases, the hypostasis of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. And this became the definitive doctrine of the Trinity in the East. So two key works that I'll be looking at today, uh, really kind of showing the theologically rigid orthodoxy of the Nicaeans is his writing called Against Eunomius. He is a refutation of the Apology of Eunomius, who was an Arian extremist. And then the, the latter work we'll be looking at is On the Holy Spirit, which is one of the first treatises <coughs> excuse me, from the Church Fathers solely focused on the Spirit. So in his treatise on the Spirit, excuse me, the heresy, of, the heresy, the heresy, the heresy, the heresy of Arius not only lowered the dignity of the Son, he lowered the dignity of the Spirit as well. So during the Arian controversy, the attention centered mostly on the Son. In fact, the Arian creeds did not directly attack the divinity of the Spirit. However, they did not affirm his unity with the Father. The doctrinal status of the Spirit remained in the foreground, and this created more confusion as the debate continued. Doctrinal unity on the Trinity regarding the divine persons needed to be ironed out. Uh, a gentleman by the name of Amphilochius, or Amphilochius, however you want to say that, he was a cousin to Gregory of Nazianzus and a friend of Basil. And he visited Basil in 374, and he urged him to write this treatise on the Holy Spirit. And he did, and, it, and basically his work on the Spirit removed all doubt as to the nature and the person of the Spirit, that he's fully divine, God of God, with the Father and the Son. So in his book, Against Eunomius, it's divided up into three parts or books, however you want to call it. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the center of the debate is not on we, whether we are to use names like Father, Son, and Spirit, or whether to apply the term God to the Father and Son, 
but rather it is about how to divide up or to switch metaphors as far as how to map the territory. It is about what is meant when God is said to be the unbegotten or father or good, not whether one should say these things in the first place. So the main themes of Basil's response are, one, the role of conceptualization in theology, number two, the distinction between <coughs> excuse me, positive and negative theological terms, number three, the distinction between names said in common of the Father and the Son, and names specifically of each, and then number four, the distinction between what is true of God in, say, right, the inner trinity, uh, and from eternity, and what God has done on behalf of humans, whose perspective is inherently temporally structured. So the inse in the ad extra of God. So in book one, hold on a second. So in book one, Basil begins by engaging in argumentation about the nature of human speech about God, termed in the Greek epinoia, which we would call conceptualization. And I mentioned this in our last discussion. Again, the whole point of these lectures, of, of really, well, not these lectures, but of what the early church was trying to do was to come up with a grammar, right, a grammar to conceptualize uh, God. Obviously, these are things that we can just not fully comprehend, but we can grasp certain things. And so epinoia was a way of conceptualizing uh, things about God. Again, we're trying to tailor human speech to speak about God, uh, not in a one-to-one, -one, like a, a univo univocal um, um, attribution, but really a way to say what God is like. So regarding epinoia, um, it is defined as the activity of reflecting on and identifying the distinct qualities or properties of something. So Eunomius asserts that we cannot know God by way of epinoia, and Basil responds in, in detail explaining this process that we do all the time. His point is to demonstrate how scripture accommodates the divine to human capacities. Now obviously those that read the Bible you know, there's a lot of metaphorical and figurative language to use in the Bible. That's God's, uh, you know, taking account our capacities as creatures and tailoring or accommodating the language to our sensibilities, our ability to understand and comprehend and grasp. So a basic example of epinoia or conceptualization, he gives the example of grain. He says, when one looks at a simple grain seed and sees one little piece of grain, however, when examining it in detail, one can conceive or conceptualize different designations to indicate the different things that we have conceived. For example, the grain at one time is called fruit, another is seed, and another is nourishment. These categories are assigned based on the different times or stages of the grain's life, planting, harvesting, consuming. See what he, You kind of see where he's going with this? He notes that such concepts do not dissolve after, uh, um, after utterance, a similar phrase Eunomius used. Rather, the, the concepts remain settled in the soul of the one who has conceived them. To sum it up, Basil writes, Generally speaking, all things recognized through sense perception, in which seem simple in substrate, or which means the substance of the thing, but which admit of a complex account upon further consideration, are said to be considered considering through conceptualization. So so back to the grain piece. So we think of a, of a grain of rice or just a grain in general, it becomes a fruit. It's also a seed. It provides nourishment. So there's different ways that we can attribute or conceive or conceptualize the things that we know of uh, firsthand. And again, the whole point is when you trek through the grain's life, there's the planting, the harvesting, and the consuming, right? The seed goes in the ground, it harvests and becomes a, an edible object, a fruit, a vegetable, whatever it is, and then we consume it. So all these different things of that same seed, we actually can now intake in different different states of that seed's um, existence. So Basil now moves into this practice, theologically speaking. So in scripture, Christ gave himself ma many designations, such as the door, the way, the bread of life, the vine, the shepherd, and the light. Now while Christ as God is one simple, not composite, and is not composite, he references himself by many other things, which differ from each other as well. And he does so based on his different activities and his relation to the objects of his divine benefaction or gift. To note a few, note a few, no, <laughs> to note a few, I kept wanting to say fuel, to note a few, 
Uh, Basil writes that Christ calls himself the light of the world because he illumines those who have purified the eye of their soul with the splendor of his knowledge. And he calls himself the vine because he nurtures those who have been planted in him by faith so that they bear fruits of good works. So in doing epinoia, we can conceive of God's redemptive work through the association of real things that we sense in the world, thus enabling believers to grow deeper in their knowledge of Christ. Uh, historical theologian John Barrick commenting on this passage, he notes, We do not reflect on the essence itself, but on the way in which it appears to us, the manner in which it presents or reveals itself, in other words, its activity to us, or as energeia is the, is the proper word. <clears throat> Therefore, uh, Basil questions, Why then can we not have a conceptual framework for the unbegotten God of the universe? The term unbegotten is the focal point of the entire debate. And then Basil writes, <clears throat> this should be a, oh, <clears throat> excuse me. He says, we will discover that the name unbegotten is said in no other way. For we say that the God of the universe is incorruptible and unbegotten, designating him with these names according to various aspects. Whenever we consider ages past, we find that the life of God transcends every beginning and say that he is unbegotten. <clears throat> Whenever we stretch our mind forward to the ages to come, we designate the one who is without boundary, infinite, and comprehended by no terminal point as incorruptible. Therefore, just as incorruptible is the name we give him because his life is without an end, so too is unbegotten the name given because his life is without a beginning, when we consider each through conceptualization. What reason could there be then for denying that each of these names is conceptualized and that they constitute a confession of what truly belongs to God? End quote. <clears throat> so Eunomius claims that human conceptualization of God dishonors him, calling him unbegotten is to confess that he is what he is, which Eunomius says God's substance is unbegotten. And so the issue in Eunomius' claim is that in asserting God's substance is unbegotten, the relational term of origin given to the Son, begotten, then situates the Son less than the Father because Eunomius erroneously, univocally states unbegotten equals divine essence. So here is his error. He's saying that the term unbegotten equals divine essence. So, if we're not calling the Son unbegotten, then we're saying He is less than the Father. Now, obviously, we, if, if you've been tracking with these lectures, we know that, that names do, do not indicate essence, uh, the actual substance of what God is. We know He's spirit. <clears throat> that was the error. Interestingly, I had... I slides referenced, and on this copy, I don't for some reason. Oh, I see. The color ran out. Sorry about that. So I'm about to kind of fumble my way through this. All right. So Basil unfolds, or Basil, sorry. Basil unfolds the implications from Eunomius' reasoning, stating that if one is to avoid making conceptualizations about God because they profane his holiness, then all things that we attribute to God are then references to his substance. However, would it not be absurd to refer to God's creative power, providence, and foreknowledge as his substance? You see what's happening here? The point is, such designations all landing on the same meaning provide us with no means of making distinctions about God as the scripture teaches. So Psalm 103.24 talks about his creativity. Uh, 144.6, his encompassing providence. And Psalm 17.2 speaks about his invisible nature. Furthermore, Basil contends that if we follow Eunomius' logic, then he actually refutes himself because Scripture makes the same designations about the Son. Therefore, according to Eunomius, such terms would be indicative of the Son's substance. But he doesn't apply this method in references to the Son, which reveals Eunomius' in, uh, inconsistent reasoning. He's being arbitrary. But utilizing epinoia allows us to meditate on the fullness of God's splendor, speaking of his attributes about what God is like, while avoiding stating what God is. 
Furthermore, in Epinoia, we deploy the use of apophatic theology, which gives us a framework of ascription that keeps us from falling into inappropriate notions in or suppositions about God. So when we say that God is incorruptible, we are saying that God is not subject to corruptions. Invisible, we are saying that God is not observed through our eyes. Immortal, God cannot die. So unlike Eunomius' claim that Epinoia is blasphemous, Basil demonstrates that it is honoring of the divine essence because it safeguards us from idolatry and that it forbids us from lowering our thoughts to the level of what is not appropriate. Remember, it's safer to say to say it's safer to say to say what God is not. <laughs> uh, Basil reiterates Eunomius' error of situating unbegottenness in the substance itself. With that said, he affirms one side of the equation. He says the substance of God is unbegotten, just not the inverse. Furthermore, Basil finds it important to remind Eunomius that partlessness and simplicity are the same thing as far as the notion is concerned. For that which is not composed of parts is partless. Similarly, that which is not constituted from many elements is simple. If you notice, he's bringing the actual word simplicity or simple into, into his theological discussion. Basil issues the rudimentary lesson because it appears that Eunomius has forgotten simplicity and its entailments. Remember, simplicity uh, was a standard, was the norm, was normative of the early church fathers. It was the ground of saying who God is, specifically his oneness, but also his threeness. Because remember, if, if he's not simple, then we can say that God is made of parts and that ultimately we are tritheistic. We see that there's three beings, of, I'm sorry, three beings of God, not, I didn't mean to show five, I was just doing a hand gesture, but three, three beings of God would be inaccurate. So simplicity uh, safeguards us from moving ourselves into heresy. And to show the absurdity of Eunomius' thinking, Basil engages in a discussion about our lack of rational knowledge about the earth, its parts, its form, along with human sensations, in that through sense perception, we can comprehend the elements all around us, but in no way are we able to comprehend them rationally speaking. While we can distinguish between hard and soft, heat and cold, and such other things, we would not attribute softness to its substance. Therefore, it is of the, quote, utmost insanity, end quote, to think we can comprehend the divine essence, attributing unbegottenness as its substance. But Basil returns to scripture to demonstrate the mode of knowledge we attain about God and the way we attain it. <clears throat> he writes, It is to be expected that the very substance of God is incomprehensible to everyone except the only begotten and the Holy Spirit. But we are led up from the activities of God and gain knowledge of the Maker through what he has made, and so come in this way to an understanding of his goodness and wisdom. For what can be known about God is that which God has manifested to all human things. The emphasis on the activities of God in which the world was made points us to the way of causality in that whatever effect is observed, the cause has a relation to it. I say cause with a big C. And the effects that we see, which demonstrate goodness and beauty, bring us to the conclusion that God is good and beautiful. And scripture, thus God, expresses himself in figurative language so that we can associate what we can comprehend with what we cannot comprehend, the divine essence. Basil notes that Eunomius' error of directly applying anthropomorphic language in scripture to God literally is what the atheists do. And this is clearly not what the scripture intends for us to do. If we do, Basil writes, then we would have to conclude that God has loins of amber from Ezekiel 8.2, that he is a consuming fire from Deuteronomy 4.24, and has hair like the whitest wool, Daniel 7.9. So moving forward from such idle curiosity, Basil draws our attention to Hebrews 11.6, in which the inspired writer says, one must believe that God exists and that he rewards those who speak, sorry, who seek him. Basil's point in referencing this passage is in line with what I said earlier. The divine essence is incomprehensible and ineffable to human nature, and we must therefore examine unbegottenness itself. 
In doing so, quote, we find that our notion of unbegottenness does not fall under the examination of what it is, but rather, and here I'm forced to speak this way, under the examination of what it is like. Did I have that in the slide? No, I didn't. Okay. Thus, <clears throat> excuse me, thus we consistently apply the distinction between positive and negative terms in our God talk. Therefore, unbegottenness does not signify his what, but that he is from no source. Now, he says that Luke's genealogical genealogical account from Luke 3, 23 to 38 demonstrates God's demonstrates God's unbegottenness in that he starts according to the flesh, working backwards, tracing the lineage back to Adam, and he stops there. And Basil says, quote, Isn't it obvious in each one of our minds that God came from no one? End quote. Here he sounds the death knell. He writes, Clearly, that which is from no one is without origin, and that which is without origin is unbegotten. Therefore, just as being from someone is not the substance when we are talking about human beings, so too when we are talking about the God of the universe, it is not possible to say that unbegotten, which is equivalent to saying from no one, is the substance. Definitely a hammering point. So having refuted, having refuted Eunomius' point, Basil moves on to address a most harmful thing of all, for his blasphemy against the Holy One. I'm sorry, only begotten. Eunomius says that God as unbegotten could never admit a begetting that gives a proper share of his nature to the begotten. His intention, writes Basil, Basil, sorry, is to show that the Son is unlike the Father without using their names, subtle villainy, he calls it, quote, shameless and wicked blasphemy. Eunomius' angles demonstrate that because God is unbegotten, and he cannot give a share of his nature to a begotten, then there cannot be a true comparison between the two. The point, the point here is to divide the Father from the Son. Since Eunomius does not believe that the Son shares the same essence as God the Father. But Basil retorts that such claims go against Scripture, which shows a proper comparison from the Son and the Father. Furthermore, to say otherwise, Basil writes, is to say that, quote, the apostles are liars, and that the Gospels are liars, end quote. He continues, quote, If he has no comparison whatsoever with the Father, how could Jesus say to Philip, Have I been with you for so long a time you do not see me, Philip? John 14, 9. How could he say, The one who sees me, the one who, sorry, the one who sees me sees the one who sent me? John 12, 45, end quote. So his point is that the Son as the image of God has the impression of the Father stamped on him. That which is unknown to us, the Father, has made himself known to us in the Son. Therefore, the image of the invisible God must be like that image. You tracking with me? And such is this likeness in Christ from the Father, that Jesus also says in John 14, 9, who says, The one who has seen me has seen the Father. <coughs> Excuse me. Basil offers a few other proof texts, uh, Colossians 1.15 and Philippians 2.6. Noting Paul's words about Christ having the form of God reveals without a doubt the distinctive feature of the divine substance. Eunomius' antics leading him, leading him to sever the comparison between the begotten and the unbegotten actually cut us, from, cut us off from attaining upward knowledge that occurs through the Son. End quote. So Basil's remark here is crucial to observe in Eunomius' flawed theology. If the Son has no comparison to the Father, then statements of Christ having the radiance of the Father, the character of his subsistence from Hebrews 1.3, are ultimately meaningless. So Basil brings Book 1 to a close with a response to Eunomius' misunderstanding of the greater-than-I language that the Son uses in John's Gospel. His mistake is a categorical one. For him, likeness is a question of form and equality, a question of mass, which is proper to that which has composition. But the Father is simple, and so is the Son, as Basil notes. So things that have composition, having shape and figure, quote, likeness is considered to be a question 
of identity of form, end quote. But for that which does not have form, which is God, but is nature, the likeness is in the substance itself. Therefore, Basil writes, quote, In this case, equality is not a question of comparing masses, but rather identity of power, as displayed in divine actions activity. Christ, the power of God, the wisdom of God. In Christ, all the Father's power is contained, which we see in John 5.19. And Jesus is saying that whatever the Father does, the Son does likewise. And this error is exactly what Jesus chides the Jews for, and that he calls them to judge his claims of divinity, not by his words, which man speaks, right, but by his actions, which are acts of God that only sorry, which are acts of power that only God can do. But for Eunomius, Father signifies activity and not substance. So when the Son says the Father is greater than I, the activity is greater than the product. The comparison then does not hold through because other passages speak of the Son as the power of God. The Son and the Father are one, John 10.30, which refers to equality and identity in power. Therefore, greater than language, Basil writes, is according to the account of cause, in that the Son's principle comes from the Father, his generation, so in this sense the Father is greater as cause and principle. End quote. So again, we're talking about the relationship of the Son to the Father, and if we know what the monarchical view of the, of the Trinity is, the Father is the principle or the cause, and the Son comes from him uh, in the relation of the unbegottenness of the unbegotten, I'm sorry, of the begotten one. So the unbegotten Father, the begotten Son, and then there's the Spirit that comes from the Father as well, according to an Eastern Trinitarian view. So that's how Basil makes sense of this language and stays orthodox and can explain that ultimately it goes back to the relation to the Father when he's speaking of that the, that the Father is greater than I. Now, one might say, is that really what the... Um, early church would have understood that passage to mean, as far as the the original audience, the first century church. Um, you know, I don't think so. And, I, and the reason I, I say that is because, as you can see, it takes a lot of conceptual lifting to really kind of get to these p perspectives. But because we know that the Bible is basically endless when it comes to exhausting its treasures and understanding things of what God has told us and revealed to us, that as, as heretical teachings come about, the biblical texts obviously form the foundation of our understanding, but then we come up with this grammatical conceptual language to support those statements when, when heresies kind of work their way in. Because if we, if we don't use this language that, we're, that Basil here uses to express these metaphysical statements, then ultimately we do put ourselves in a position to be open to believing that Christ is merely a subordinate deity, or he's a god, as the Jehovah's Witness would say, or as the Arians would say, that he's there's a time that he was created. But we know that all the same attributes that are spoken of about God the Father are also spoken about the Son. So we have to be able to say that God the Father, God the Spirit, and God the Son are all one in the way of speaking that voids tritheism, but retains the monotheism that the Bible teaches. Sorry, I need to massage my cheeks real quick. All right. And while the distinction is a relation of origin, the Father is unbegotten and the Son is begotten, because of the equality, identity, and power, the Father's substance is not greater than the Son's substance because they share the same essence. And we may have to conclude as much because God declares that he is one God. So Basil's consistency pays off in that he doesn't confuse categories in his theological language as observed in Eunomius. And that's their end of book one. Like I said, that what he what he ultimately arrived at, as we saw, is that he's making the distinctions about the relationships. The relationships. That's where the early church heresies were when went haywire is confusing that. And like I said, it's about having a theological grammar that allows us to be concise and precise in what we say and not veer off into uh, tritheism or polytheism. All right. So in book two, Basil titles it On the Sun. Hold on a second here. I got these little sores on my lips. Need to 
freshen up for you all. Okay. So he opens this work in response to Eunomius' blasphemies against the sun, whereby he refers to him as something begotten, um, specifically as an offspring or something that is made, which is like a product or a work. Uh, Ganema is the begotten term in Greek, and poema is the Greek term for those as well. So ultimately, again, there's something that he came to be according to some type of, of uh, human, human offspring or human work, that kind of thing. That's the, that's the categories he's using. So Basil states such a claim has never been made about the sun. He cites various passages that speak about the things that are made in creation. Genesis 1.1, Psalm 142.5, and Romans 1.20. While there are passages that are metaphorical references or figurative language, employing terms pertaining to things that are made, like rocks, uh, river, door, etc., right, right, about Christ, nowhere in Scripture do we see any writer referring to Christ as something made. He is not... He's not a work, right, of, of God in the sense of, of fashioning something together, um, nor is he any type of, like, offspring that God produced according to, like, human generation. So in the following section, we now see Basil unpack theology and economy, where he engages in discussion in Christ's eternal divine being apart from his works. We call that theologia. And economia, in reference to the unfolding of the redemptive drama, is where we see the outworking of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. So theologia would be the in se, the God in himself understanding, and the economia, or economy, is the unfolding of God's self in the redemptive drama in real space and time. The Father and the Spirit are being manifested, and we would say that because God God acts eternally, his act, though, though to us as creatures, is through a redemptive timeline, God's self revealing himself in that manner is one act, which for which to us occurs at different times. But for God, it's just one movement. He's not moving in parts. Uh, he, he, God doesn't work that way. Uh, but for us, that's how we ultimately comprehend it. So Basil must move in this direction because Eunomius is trying to edge his argument based on the Incarnation, the begetting of the Son in time and space, arguing that the Apostles were communicating about his substance in his human manifestation. So Basil returns, stating, quote, He who said God made him Lord and Christ, that's from Acts 2.36, is speaking of his rule and power over all which the Father entrusted to him. He is not describing his arrival at being, end quote. So you know, Mrs. mistake was to transfer the expression he created to the original begetting of the only begotten. Lord does not denote his substance, but the economy of Christ as Lord is possessing power and rule over all creation. It's the enactment. It's the theodrama. It's this when this actually happens that the Son comes into creation, not in his being, but in the flesh. Basil outlines the absurdity of Eunomius' methodology in assuming names mean substance, and it also means different substance. Peter and John have different names, but both share the same substance. It is, it, it is their distinguishing marks considered in connection with each one of us that we are different each from the other. So names do not imply substance. Rather, the name determines the character of an individual and Basil goes on to speak about biblical figures such as Paul and all the distinguishing marks we associate with him, encompassed in the name Paul. So Basil, in a warm tone, <laughs> that's, that's uh, sarcasm, says, quote, There is no one so stupid and so inattentive to the common nature that he would be led to say this, that names equal substance. My name, Brian, does not equal the substance of humanity. For example, if we follow Eunomius' univocal designation method, then Basil notes, when scripture refers to human beings as gods, then we would be led to say that they have the same substance as the god of the universe. But Basil says that is nothing but, quote, sheer madness. He goes on to say Eunomius' logic here is equally crazy. Therefore, in line with the economy, the names Father and Son do not communicate the divine essence, but rather they are revelatory, sorry, revelatory of the distinguishing marks of the divine persons. Back to relationships. Basil's onslaught is intense. 
Key passages, John 1.1, 1, 1, Hebrews 1.3, serve at the front of his attacks. A plain reading of these passages becomes a stumbling block for Basil's op op opponents. And this stems from the metaphysical foundation that supports the dogmatic claims derived from the text. Basil takes them for granted because they have been deployed to develop a consistent theology, metaphysically and economically, or theologically and hermeneutically. The theological grammar provides a consistent manner of exegesis that, when used in refutation, is quite dumbfounding because the errors being refuted are addressed through what is a very basic and logical approach, uh, leaving us scratching our heads that one could arrive at such absurd conclusions. And we also, and I'm referring to us 1,700 years later. So back to Eunomius. So Basil asked the question, this is rhetorically speaking, he says, was God the word with God in the beginning, John 1, or did he supervene later? Well, in John's account, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So for Basil, this seems pretty basic. He writes, is that a quote? I don't know. Nope. Okay, I haven't got to that point yet. He writes, Basil writes, The Son's existence from eternity, his beginning without passion. His beginning, yeah, beginning without passion is kind of a weird sentence. Sorry. His connaturality, con naturality with the Father, the majesty of his nature, all these points he, John, covers in a few words by including was, he guides us back to the beginning, end quote. Basil refers, references other passages, John 1.4, 1, John 1.9, 1, that demonstrate the eternity of the Son. But let me cover this again real quick. So he's saying that, that these points, these statements about, about God, so the Son's existence from eternity, that he's begetting without passion, which means he, he, he's, he's begotten from the Father, but not in a manner of how human begetting is, right? There's no passion. There's no passion there. Uh, his connaturality with the Father, so the sharing the same nature as the Father. His majesty of his nature. So Basil says that all these phrases, these statements, all these points, John, the writer of the Gospel of John, in a few words, includes all of this. So when he says, was, he is guiding us back to the beginning. So all of that is included in the in the word was. Hope that's helpful. <clears throat> so Eunomius rejects the Spirit's testimony about the only begotten who was with God and is God. He was begotten, Eunomius will say, but it was not in the beginning according to a sensible reading of the Apostles' words would have it. Basil is passionate about giving the proper glory due to the Son. He refers to the importance of avoiding corporeal comparisons in material imaginations, and that we are to take our cue from the Spirit-authored Scripture, who has transmitted to us in his holy word, quote, a begetting that is worthy of God, one without passion, partition, division, and temporality, being led to the divine begetting in a way consistent with a radiance that shines forth from light, period, end quote. Now, one thing I want to say, when I mentioned earlier, oh man, sorry, my jaw. When I mentioned earlier about with the early church, from specifically with the, with the first century hearers, been able to arrive at the same conclusions that the early church fathers have, metaphysically speaking, about God. And I said, no. But we know that, one thing I want to clarify is that as we understand from Scripture, and we understand our redemptive history, that theology develops historically. All right? Theology develops historically as the world confronts the Word of God and various doctrines, various teachings, things come up that impose, that threaten what the Bible says. So what Basil here references saying was, was all encompassed in the word was, was something that in a sense that um, I would say with the very first century hearers arrived at this, well, obviously they didn't. Otherwise it would have taken so long. But again, it also wasn't something that needed to be unpacked. But as words can be expounded, as we do all the time, and show the immense riches in God's word, in that, fr in that phrase was, taking us back to the beginning, the implications that if the Son is the same as the Father by nature, he was with God and is God, then all these designations about God the Father have to be implied of the Son, so therefore the word was encapsulates all those things. So we would say that 
ultimately that phrase, that sentence, if you will, we'll do that, was pregnant with this understanding that the Lord brought about through, uh, through theological history, through the Christian tradition, as he brought challenges to his church to shape his church, to refine his church, to make sure that sound doctrine was being uh, continued on. I mean, obviously, when you do read the New Testament, um, there is a little development in, in theology. There's development there where Paul talks about the, the son's essence, um, the the whole the wholeness the fullness of his deity dwelt bodily. I mean that term fullness wasn't even really used earlier in the New Testament. Um, it kind of came later. So we can see there is this development in the text itself that we see that theology does grow. Um, but the, the obviously the foundation is always the biblical text. So I hope that was uh, helpful. In their drink. So. Uh, Basil directs us to the light of Revelation in Colossians 1.15, that of the Son as the invisible image of God, he puts, he says, coexistent with and subsides with the one who brought him into subsistence. So Colossians 1.15 is a famous passage that really, that again, you see Paul expound a little further in his, in his, in his uh, theology about the Son uh, from the Father. So the harmony of the scriptural text, Basil notes, do not, however, perfectly bring together the temporal and eternal realities. Rather, we are to take them as the Spirit has given them to us, even if we can't apprehend begetting in our minds in a manner that does not involve passion. So he means by, I understand begetting is that a husband and a wife come together, procreate, and produce a child. They beget a child. We can't understand it any other way. It's, it's ineffable, as he has said. But we're, we're talking about relationships, not the materiality, not the temporal version of it. We're trying to speak in a way that's uh, uh, in, the, in the realm of eternal, which really, we can't really go there, but we're trying the best we can. <laughs> uh, Basil supplies other classic element, or classic text, excuse me, that support the unity of being and the sameness of the divine essence the Son has with the Father, in that he is the power, the wisdom, and the righteousness of God. We see that in 1 Corinthians one twenty four, and verse 30, excuse me. Though not as a possession of God, but rather as the essence of the one simple being of God. The question that always pops up in early church is to say, when was God without his wisdom? Well, he couldn't have been. So if Christ is the wisdom of God, and God could have never been without his wisdom, his divine wisdom, and think of what kind of wisdom, divine wisdom would need to be, then the Son then, if he is the wisdom of God, must be divine, and must have always been with God uh, from the beginning, from eternity, excuse me, from eternity. It's a very simple, logical conclusion that uh, today, if we just kind of revisited those phrases and asked those questions, um, the implications there will really prove the deity of Christ. Um, where was I at? Okay. So he, speaking of the Son, is the radiance of the glory of God, revealing the Father in his entirety as he is the radiance of his glory in its entirety. It is absurd to think, Basil writes, that the glory of God is without his radiance, and that at some point the wisdom of God was not with God, to my point before, right? So then, to answer the ineffable but providing the proper logical location of the Son's point of origin, Basil asks, quote, When was he brought into being by the Father? From whatever point the Father exists. End quote. So again, when was the Son brought into existence? He was brought into being by the Father. Whatever point did the Father exist? He is from eternity. So what does that mean about the Son? That the Son is from eternity, connected in a begotten way to the unbegottenness of the Father. Again, we're talking about relations between the two. Begottenness and unbegottenness does not equal divine substance. So Eunomius denies these notions because to him, the Father as eternal is the same as without beginning. Again, go back to that error, right? So the Father as eternal is the same as without beginning. Thus he is unbegotten, having no cause of his own being. But because the Son is said to be begotten, okay, that new phrase in there, begotten, thus he has a cause to his being and is not eternal. Track with me there? Because he associates unbegotten, right, as being without beginning, that there is 
no point, no cause, right? No point, no cause. When the Son now is being spoken of as the begotten, he must have a point of cause, a point of origin, but he uses that temporally speaking. We would say eternally, by relationship, the Son is begotten from the unbegotten Father. But when did the Father exist? From eternity. When did the Son exist? From eternity. Um, so Eunomius's blasphemous views noted here cause Basil to go off the rails. <laughs> Quote, he says, We do not construe the only begotten as having a substance in common with those which have come to be from nothing, which is us, right? Creation. Creation. God's world is from nothing. For that which is nothing is surely not a substance. Rather, we allot him as much superiority as the maker necessarily has over the things he himself has made. The we allot him, Basil finds deplorable. <clears throat> I want to make sure I said something right. Uh, would you not? Okay, I'm good. So a few pages later, Basil offers a quick, insightful logic of how God commanded creation to be. And he's referring to Psalm 148, verse 5, with the intention of demonstrating to Eunomius that the word is not some lifeless instrument. End quote. He writes, How do we say that all things come into being from the Son? In this way, the divine will, taking its origin from the primal cause, as from a kind of spring, proceeds to activity through his own image, God the Word. End quote. The primal cause would be the first principle, would be the Father, and the Word is his image, and the Word speaks God's wisdom, the Word speaks what God wants, and ultimately as a spring, um, the activity of God comes through his Word, and then we have creation from nothing. Uh, again, I can bring up the point that the early church constantly referred to of that we have words and we have wisdom and we speak these words and they bring about something creative, something that has meaning. But we know the words in our minds, there is nothing there. They're just to us. There is no true substance. Um, but when we communicate it, then the word is heard. And so therefore the person hearing the word hears the substance, you might even say the word perceives that substance that comes out in the word. And that's the kind of analogical relationship that um, the early church fathers would use quite a bit, speaking of uh, the Father and the Son. But again, we would never say that the Son was not a substance. Obviously, he's the divine substance. Okay, where was that? Uh, so this contrasts with Eunomius, who thinks of the Son as some kind of minister administering the things that have been assigned to him. Like he's uh, uh, basically been given this task of carrying out these various duties. <clears throat> Jehovah's Witnesses kind of say that say that of the Son as well. But Basil catches Eunomius in reasonless sophistry. Oh, man, excuse me. He mentions the distinction between the Son and the Father, begotten and unbegotten, stating that one differs from the other as the light from the light, the life from the life, and power from the power. So listen to Basil's reaction to that statement. He says, quote, Behold and grasp the horrible blasphemy, end quote. How can one differentiate the concept of light from light? It makes no sense. Can you differentiate the concept from flame from flame, light from light? You can't measure that. In Basil, seeing the inconsistency unravels Eunomius' entire position. The Son is the true light, John 1, 9. Nine, yeah, John 9. If the Father is the true light, then how can one be a lesser true light? Is the Son a dimmer light than the Father? Christ is the life, John 14, 6. The Father is the life as well, right? Can there be a lesser life? As noted, it makes no sense, and with ease, Basil pulls apart Eunomius' argument. Now, he tones it down a bit, moving into a precise articulation, identifying the error and supplying a clear designation in the divine essence and economy, showing there is no contrariety to the divine substance. And I shall quote him at length. He says, If anyone wants to accept that which is true, namely, that begotten and unbegotten are distinctive features that enable identification and are observed in the substance, 
which lead to the clear and unconfused notion of the Father and the Son, then he will escape the danger of impiety and preserve logical coherence in his reasoning. The distinctive features, which are like certain characters and forms obser observed in the substance, differentiate what is common by means of the distinguishing characters and do not under the substances sameness in nature. For example, the divinity is common, whereas fatherhood and sonship are distinguishing marks. From the combination of both, that is, of the common and the unique, we arrive at comprehension of the truth. Consequently, upon hearing unbegotten light, we think of the Father. Whereas upon hearing begotten light, we receive the notion of the Son. Insofar as they are light and light, no contrariety exists between them. Whereas insofar as they are begotten and unbegotten, one observes the opposition between them. End quote. All right, drink again. So I hope that that statement really kind of cleared it up. I know it's a little bit kind of challenging in the beginning, but the key mistake that we see in the early church fathers, not in them, but what they're trying to correct, is the popular, the common misconception, the notion of, of confusing the terms, the names of relationship, to mean they equal the divine essence. And that ultimately, he's going to show that that he doesn't do that, that you can't do that. When you do that, you mess things up. And then there's scripture that shows uh, the, the way the way of thinking, the way of articulation that Basil, Basil here is trying to do. So, of central importance in the discussion, or rather refutation, is the necessity of maintaining proper categories. Eunomius' fatal mistake regarding the concepts of nature and person, theologia and economia. When one confuses these categories, one runs into all sorts of hazards, notably a composite view of God. Allowing the language of economy, the engagement of the divine in the temporal creaturely world to function as a suitable and guiding grammar for the divine essence, blasphemy ensues. Those who reject the doctrine of divine simplicity do so not realizing, at least I don't think, they lose the oneness and the threeness of God. The confusion of terms in, in Eunomius' case, the separation of unbegotten from begotten in the divine essence, leads to a composite view of God. When scripture uses these figurative designations, such as light, for the divine persons, the purpose is to express a divine reality that communicates to our minds something about the essence of God. If we see these designations upon the Son and the Father and the Spirit, we must keep them united, otherwise we compromise our monotheism. Basil notes, if we are to retain the simplicity and partlessness of God, the names we attribute to God, invisible, incorruptible, immutable, creator, judge, and all the names to reference his glory, we would have to omit them or apply all of them to his substance. If we make that move, then, Basil asserts, we will demonstrate that God is composite and compounded from unlike parts because different things are signified by each of these names. And as we see, the doctrine of divine simplicity is crucial to retain the scriptural dictum of the oneness of the divine being of God. That ends part two. And like I said, we'll cover part three and Basil's treatise on the Holy Spirit. I hope this was helpful. Again, um, I would say continue just to remember what I said about not confusing the names of relations or designations and denoting that means the divine substance. That's where we all lose it. That's where heresy comes in. Uh, that's exactly what the, what the Bible does not teach. So, all right, we'll see you next time for part two of Basil of Caesarea. Thanks. So I keep forgetting to do this. I have a slide at the very end to show you some works to read uh, that I highly recommend. Um, I, I included these in the last few uh, few lectures and I forgot to talk about them. I did put the slide up, but in case you just stopped before then, again, really great works. Uh, Nice and its Legacy by Lewis Ayers. Fascinating, fascinating work. Um, really kind of a, a foundational text in modern, in, retrie in retrieving uh, classical theism. And then Khaled and Atalias, Retrieving Nicaea, The Development and Meaning of Trinitarian Doctrine. Again, another seminal work in, a modern, in our modern th uh, times to really retrieve and reclaim uh, classical Christian orthodoxy. And then the two works above, it's actually three, 
John Baer, who's an who's an Eastern guy, um, really great historical theology. Uh, again, he's kind of in the same camp as these three as far as his uh, depth of analysis, um, way he articulates, and, and really really kind of brings it all together to really provide this great great development of of the Christian theology. So, uh, yeah, check those out. All right, see ya.